There's a good chance many of you are watching this because you're into true crime, you've checked out all the top unsolved murder lists, and the Suzanne Jovan murder is pretty much in every one of them. And there's a good reason for this. You've got a super intelligent, popular co-ed from Yale University. She's written a thesis on Osama bin Laden. She's dropping it off in the afternoon. And then she's telling friends in the evening time, she's tired, she's been up all night writing this thing, she wants to get some sleep. And then 20 minutes after that, she's found dead. She's two miles away from campus and she's stabbed 17 times in the back of the head and neck, her throat slit, and no one can figure out what happened. Well, this was 1998, this is 20 years ago. So if there's ever gonna be a textbook case of how not to solve a murder, this is what we're talking about. Now, before I continue, I want to personally thank you for participating in my GoFundMe campaign and for watching my video. And I want to tell you personally that this case can be solved. It absolutely can. So let's dive into it. There's this misconception that the murder of Suzanne Jobin has gone unsolved for so long because of lack of evidence or that this somehow was the perfect crime. Absolutely not. I mean, we have the tip of the knife that killed her. It was lies in her skull. We have a fresca bottle with Suzanne's fingerprints on it and the partial palm print of someone else. We have fingernail scrapings. We have multiple witnesses who saw a couple arguing at the crime scene, multiple witnesses who saw a mysterious tan or brown light-colored vehicle at the crime scene, and we have the crime scene itself. You even had famed forensic expert Henry Lee volunteering to do a crime scene analysis and recreation. Some of you might recall Henry Lee from the OJ trial. He now has an entire forensic institute named after him in West Haven. Anyhow, the police turned down his offer. But if you follow this murder in real time, as I did, you know all the above was revealed in dribs and drabs over 20 years. There's a good chance there's even more evidence we aren't being told about. Sure, some of it was sent to the local crime lab, and I'm sure they did their best, but again, this is 1998. These days, because of genealogy, DNA testing is all the rage. Yet, here we have evidence that could solve a gruesome murder, yet the state of Connecticut has steadfastly refused for 20 years to get it tested using modern technology. This is insane. Look, I know no person's murder deserves any more attention than any other. I know states have an enormous number of unsolved crimes in general, and they have a limited budget. I understand that spending a big chunk of their budget on one case is not fair. I get that, and that's even more reason why I'm doing this campaign if we are not spending the state's money, if we are sending the evidence to a state-of-the-art forensics lab instead, if we are not tying up any of the state's resources to do this, if, after all that, the state of Connecticut fails to accept our generous offer, we will know if they are truly trying their best to solve this so-called cold case. Okay, so that's the forensic side of things, or CSI, as we say now. Equally botched was the investigation itself. There are a whole lot of people who saw something, tried to say something, who were totally ignored. So what happened? Well, basically, everyone panicked. If you've ever lived in a big city like New Haven, as I did in the 80s, as a matter of fact, I lived on the same street as Suzanne Jobin, you basically learn how to stay in your lane, what streets to walk down, what parks to hang out in, and what time of day is best to do all this. This was a Yale student essentially killed on the Yale campus. This was not supposed to happen, and the timing couldn't have been any worse. This was December, the time when kids are making their final decision on where to apply to schools. The last thing you want is for kids to not feel safe, that no place in New Haven is safe, even Yale. To make matters worse, because Suzanne had lived in Germany, this was not just national news, but international news as well. Yale needed the New Haven police to produce, to calm fears, the mayor of New Haven was in the spotlight. Back in 1998, there were no cameras in every street corner. You didn't have a walking army of people carrying cell phones able to record stuff. Rather, you gathered up all the usual suspects and asked them what they heard or saw, what the word on the street was. You used your gut. You made hunches. In this particular case, the hunch was that a knife killing meant this was a crime of passion. Suzanne must have willingly gotten into a car with someone she was seeing. They got into a fight. He killed her. But the person she was seeing, her boyfriend, was out of town. Strike one. Okay, maybe she was having an affair. Even better, maybe she was having an affair with a professor. Okay, what professor? How about that guy? 
the one we saw on TV last night offering her a tribute. So the police drove undergrads around insisting everyone knew about this affair. It's useless to try to cover it up. Typical police bluff, dead end, strike two. Problem is, the police had, for reasons nobody can explain, leaked the name of this professor to the press. I have heard people speculate the mayor's office signed off on this because they assumed this would ease the panic. We know who did this. Trust us. You can now feel safe again. And it worked. Everyone just assumed the police had evidence against this professor, even though they hadn't even gotten around to analyzing any of the evidence at this point. The fact there was no affair meant the police had now boxed themselves into a corner. They had a suspect, but no evidence or motive against him. No matter, we'll just change the motive. We'll just let everyone assume we have evidence. As this lunacy went on for more than a decade, I could talk straight for a month and just scratch the surface of how insane this non-investigation was. And the reason I know is because this professor was a childhood friend of mine. This was around the time I was helping law enforcement go after scam publicly traded companies. I was active on message boards such as Silicon Investor detailing all this. I knew what real investigations were supposed to look like. Thankfully, after watching the New Haven police repeatedly walk into the same brick wall, Yale finally got shamed enough to hire their own investigators, Annie Rosenzweig and Pat Harnett, both highly reputed, both desperately wanting to solve this crime. Problem is, as I learned only recently, they were encouraged to suggest avenues of investigation, even plead for them, but they were powerless to actually pursue them. That was the job of the police. Though, to their credit, even though they were not really supposed to talk about their work, Pat famously called the professor, quote, Richard Jewell with a PhD. Richard Jewell, as you might recall, was a security guard whose name was leaked to the press as the Olympic Park bomber back in 1966 in Atlanta. Apparently, the FBI found it suspicious that after finding the bomb, he actually did his job, that is, risked his life to help others evacuate. They did eventually catch the bomber, thankfully. Now, personally, I liken the professor not to Richard Jewell, but Richard Kimball, the main character in the old TV series, later hit movie, called The Fugitive. Good movie, by the way. It starred Harrison Ford, and Tommy Lee Jones was nominated for seven Oscars, and Jones won for Best Supporting Actor. Anyhow, Dr. Richard Kimball comes home to see a one-armed guy killing his wife. Kimball gets wrongly convicted, escapes from police custody, and becomes a fugitive. He needs to catch this one-armed man before the U.S. Marshal pursuing him catches him. Anyhow, my main point here is that this was never about clearing someone's name or embarrassing the New Haven police or shaming Yale for just wanting to, quote, put this murder behind us. And it's not about that now. Rather, it's all about actually trying to solve it. It's about bringing justice to Suzanne Joven. And again, as you will see, we can solve it. We will solve it. We have to. Obviously, this is a GoFundMe campaign. DNA testing is expensive, and there's a lot here to test. As you'll see shortly, there's a ton of stuff to go over. I expect there to be lots of leads to follow up and the need to contract with the right people if I or others can't do it ourselves. I've already put 20 years of my own time, effort, and money into this, so I'm invested in this for as long as it takes. If I don't do this, if we don't do this together, who will? If not now, 20 years later, when? A huge thanks to anyone who feels likewise and steps up to contribute. Okay, so let's now solve it. Onwards to part one, the murder. 20 years ago, Friday, December 4th, 1998, at about 9.53 p.m., in an upscale section of New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University senior Suzanne Jobin was found stabbed 17 times in the head and neck, her throat slashed, her body lying near the corner of East Rock and Edge Hill Roads. Her murder was never solved. The sad reality is that what makes this case high up on many people's top unsolved murders list is not because there was no evidence, but because of the way the crime was handled from day one. I truly believe, with your help, we can solve this murder. So let's start with the facts as we know them. Let's start in the afternoon. Suzanne had apparently been up all night finishing revisions to her senior thesis, which she had dropped off at some point that afternoon. She then borrowed a Yale-owned station wagon and drove to Trinity Lutheran Church located at 292 Arn Street. 
She was here to attend a pizza-making party she had organized for the local chapter of Best Buddies, an international organization that brings together students and mentally disabled adults. She drove some of the buddies to their homes and then returned her borrowed car to the Yale lot around the corner from her residence. Suzanne lived at 258 Park Street in 1998. It is now a brand new building. Back in 1998, Suzanne's apartment was on the second floor. Below was the Yale Police substation. To the left of this substation was a door that led to Suzanne's lobby, requiring a code for entry. Suzanne was back in her apartment by about 8.45 p.m. Shortly thereafter, a group of friends came by her window and waved, asking her if she wanted to join them at the movies. Suzanne politely declined, saying she had schoolwork to do. At 9.02, she logged onto her Yale email account. She logged off at 9.10. During this brief eight-minute period, the only email she wrote we know about was to a friend from whom Suzanne had borrowed GRE materials. GRE stands for Graduate Record Exam, a test one takes to get into graduate school. Suzanne had apparently relent these materials, a book and a CD, to someone else, did not yet have them in her possession, but expected to have them back shortly. Suzanne also gave her lobby access code to her friend, allowing her friend to pick up these materials without worrying if Suzanne were either home or awake. At about 9.14, Suzanne sets out on foot to return the keys of the borrowed station wagon to the police substation located at Phelps Gate, which is part of Yale's historic old campus. The most direct route here from her apartment would have been somewhat of a labyrinth through gates and courtyards, between buildings, and across streets and campuses. For sure, no vehicle could have followed her, and likely not even a stalker. Yale names its student residences colleges. Suzanne was a member of Davenport, which is right across the street from her apartment. Suzanne most likely would have used her entry card to open the lock gate across the street to enter Davenport. Once in, she'd have passed through a couple of courtyards and exited through another gate that leads out onto York Street. Once on York Street, just a few doors down would have been Krauser's Market. We'll talk more about that market later. To continue to Phelps Gate, Suzanne would have crossed York Street to take the passageway between Branford on the left and Jonathan Edwards College on the right. That would have put her across the street from Yale's old campus, which is surrounded by buildings and a big ornate metal gate. Once again, her only real choice would have been to go through the main entryway, which is typically always open. At this point, Phelps Gate would be in sight, diagonally across to her right. She'd have most likely taken the walkway directly there. Shortly before arriving at Phelps Gate, Suzanne encounters classmate Peter Stein, and the two briefly speak. This would have been around 9.22 p.m. Stein is quoted by the Yale Daily News as saying, quote, She did not mention plans to go anywhere or do anything else afterward. She just said that she was very, very tired and that she was looking forward to getting a lot of sleep. Stein told me personally they talked for about two to three minutes and that she did not seem nervous or excited, was not wearing a backpack, and was only holding what we now think was the paperwork she intended to drop off with keys at the police substation. Inside Phelps Gate is where the police substation used to be. As I recall, it resembled a subway token booth with a well under the thick glass window where Suzanne would have slid the keys and paperwork to the person manning it. The officer on duty that night told investigators that he had known Suzanne from having also worked at the substation under her apartment. They would typically chat when they saw each other, but that night, in contrast to what Peter Stein had said, he described Suzanne as being hasty. Rather than turn and retrace her steps, the officer observed Suzanne continue to proceed through Phelps Gate and onto College Street. If you take a left out of Phelps Gate and walk seven-tenths of a mile up College Street, you will reach Yale's Ingalls Rink, that night the host of the Yale vs. Princeton hockey game. We can assume Suzanne made a left turn, technically walking north on College, because a classmate walking back from the game recalled passing her about here. This spot was the last reported place Suzanne was seen, before being discovered near death 20 to 25 minutes later, nearly two miles away on the corner of East Rock and Edge Hill Road. The daytime temperature for December 4, 1998 had reached a record 73 degrees. It was reported that the unusually warm night had enticed many people to be out and about in this well-lit area. Indeed, a Yale medical resident and her male friend had parked in this upscale section of New Haven to stroll around and see the Christmas decorations. They began to walk up East Rock Road towards Edge Hill they hear a solitary scream, but are not alarmed. When the couple reach this corner, the medical resident reports seeing Suzanne lying on her stomach, feet on the road, body on the grassy area between the road and the sidewalk. Even though it was later determined that Suzanne had been stabbed 17 times with the back of her head and neck, her throat slit, astonishingly, she is still alive. 
the resident tells her friend to run back to their car and use his portable phone to call 911. It is 9.55 by the time he is able to do so. The police arrive at 9.58. Suzanne is officially pronounced dead at 10.26 p.m. at Yale New Haven Hospital. There is universal consensus that Suzanne had to have been driven from Yale's campus to this location. Was she abducted? Did she willingly get into the vehicle? Was there any sign she was robbed? Did she have defensive wounds? Did the police find the murder weapon or any potential clues found at the scene? Please join me for part two, where I will begin our discussion of the evidence, starting with the mysterious tan or brown van and the Fresca bottle. Let's quickly recap what we learned in part one. If you did not see part one, it will for sure make this video that much easier to understand. On Friday, December 4th, 1998, at about 9.53 p.m., Yale University senior Suzanne Joven is found in an upscale section of New Haven, Connecticut, about two miles from campus, stabbed 17 times in the head and neck, her throat slashed. She was pronounced dead at 10.26 p.m. at Yale New Haven Hospital. Suzanne had apparently been up all night finishing a draft of her senior thesis, finally dropping it off in the afternoon. She then signed out a university-owned station wagon to attend a pizza-making party she had organized for the local chapter of Best Buddies, drove some of the buddies to their homes, and then returned her borrowed car to the Yale lot around the corner from her residence. Suzanne logs onto her computer at 9.02 p.m., writing an email to a friend from whom Suzanne had borrowed GRE, its graduate record exam, test materials. Suzanne had apparently relent these materials, a book and a CD, to someone else, did not yet have them in her possession, but expected to have them back shortly. Suzanne gives her lobby access code to her friend to allow her friend to come at her friend's convenience. Suzanne logs off at 9.08. At about 9.14, Suzanne sets out on foot to return the keys of the borrowed station wagon to the police substation located at Phelps Gate, which is part of Yale's historic old campus. At about 9.22, she encounters fellow undergrad Peter Stein, who she tells she is tired and looking forward to getting some sleep. At about 9.25, she returns the keys and associated paperwork to the police substation, but rather than retracing her steps, she continues through Phelps Gate to College Street, takes a left, and begins walking north. Somewhere between 9.25 and 9.30, Suzanne, not too far away from Phelps Gate, is passed by another fellow student walking in the opposite direction. About 1.9 miles from this spot, approximately 25 minutes later, on the corner of East Rock and Edge Hill Roads, Suzanne's nearly lifeless body is found by two passers-by. The first question is whether Suzanne walked the 1.9 miles from where she was last seen alive to the intersection of where she was found stabbed. As Suzanne was wearing jeans and boots, we can safely assume she was not about to set out for a jog. A typical walking pace is 3 miles an hour. A brisk walking pace might be about 4 miles an hour. That means it would have likely taken her between 28 and 38 minutes just to get from A to B, already what I like to call a gotcha, something we can discount not because it's impossible, but because it's rather highly improbable. No surprise, of course, that there is universal agreement Suzanne had to have at some point gotten into a vehicle. The question then becomes, did she get into a vehicle with someone she knew, or was she perhaps abducted? Let's ponder the various she did not know her killer scenarios. A similar question is whether Suzanne had planned to meet someone for a ride, or if her ride were unplanned. Clearly, if she were abducted, the ride would have been unplanned, but it's possible if she knew her attacker, then either planned or unplanned would apply. Insofar as unplanned rides are concerned, we can broadly break that down into scenarios where she was followed or stalked versus where there was a rendezvous of some sort. Recall that Suzanne's route that night had her cross the street in front of her apartment, go through a locked gate, weave through college courtyards, pass across another street, walk between buildings, across Yale's old campus, and onto College Street walking against traffic. Had she taken the next left turn onto Elm Street to head back towards her apartment, she would have been walking against traffic on a one-way road. Therefore, it would have been impossible for someone to have followed her in a vehicle. If someone were stalking her on foot, then where was their car? We can therefore safely discount any stalking scenarios and instead focus on a rendezvous somewhere. But where? At this point, we need to introduce two new pieces of evidence. The first is what the New Haven police described as a tan or brown van stopped on the roadway facing east, immediately adjacent to where Suzanne was found. When I pressed Detective Norwood for more information on this van, I was told that immediately adjacent did not mean in front of where Suzanne was found, but nearby, which had to mean on the opposite side of East Rock Road. This was not a minivan, but rather something used for commercial purposes. 
though it did not have any identifiable markings on it that might have tied it to a profession. We would subsequently learn that the police at some point had impounded a mysterious van, a 1982 Dodge B2 Ram van to be precise. Note that these sorts of vans came in all sorts of configurations and varied year to year. The other piece of evidence is a fresco bottle that was in the bushes in front of where Suzanne's body was found. It had her fingerprints on it, as well as a partial palm print of an unknown person. The only place open at that hour that sold that brand of soda was Krauser's Market, located at 264 York Street. We heard anecdotally that Fresca was Suzanne's soda of choice, though could never confirm as such. Fresca is a carbonated, sugar-free grapefruit beverage. Peter Stein, the witness who encountered Suzanne shortly before she had returned the station wagon keys to the police substation at Phelps Gate, told me Suzanne was not carrying a soda and was not wearing either a backpack or any clothing that might have been suitable for storing a soda. That implies we now have to place Suzanne at Krauser's Market. It means she had to have continued north on College Street and then taken a left on Elm Street. Elm Street is quite well trafficked. Cars get up to speed from the prior intersection and only slow down if the light turns against them. All of these things make this section of Elm not at all conducive to someone lying in wait in their car, or perhaps even stopping suddenly to grab someone randomly off the street. One block up, where Elm crosses York Street, is where Krauser's Market used to be, 264 York Street to be exact. This is also a busy intersection. The left turn only lane makes double parking quite a risky business. All parking is metered. Finding a space can be challenging. That makes this location quite safe to hang out and wait for a friend, but not a good spot to sit idling in a car or park temporarily. If there were an abduction, it would have to have been elsewhere. Recall that not too far down from here is the gate Suzanne likely exited through on her way to Yale's old campus. As this would have taken her back through courtyards into her apartment upstairs from Yale Police Substation, it's hard to imagine an abduction along that route. We therefore are forced to speculate she would have had to continue her journey home by an alternate route. Specifically, she would likely have continued going north on Elm Street until she reached Park Street where she lived. The section of Elm Street between York and Park Streets has been reconfigured since 1998, and for good reason. It used to be a dark and secluded area. Back in December of 1998, this area housed the boarded-up remains of a restaurant called the Daily Cafe. So this area, already somewhat isolated and dark, was even more so. In the 80s, I used to also live on Park Street, about three blocks further down the road than Suzanne. It was so bad that I'd routinely walk one block over to York Street to access downtown rather than head straight down Park. That's why if indeed Suzanne had been abducted, it would most likely have happened here. Recall our timeline had Suzanne being last seen walking north on College Street at around 9.25 to 9.30. Let's go with 9.25 to allow as much time as possible to transpire before she was found stabbed at around 9.53. By my estimate, it would have taken Suzanne four minutes to walk to Krauser's. Again, to save time, let's figure she went right to the cold sodas located at the back right corner of the store, made a beeline to the register located near the front door, waited briefly in line, paid, and exited say that all took a mere three minutes. That puts us at 9.32. She now has to walk to this isolated section of Elm Street and somehow be, shall we say, convinced to get into a stranger's van. We know Suzanne was killed with a knife. Of course, it's possible her attacker might have also had a gun, but we really can't assume as such. That means for an abduction to have happened, one or more people would have had to have forced Suzanne into a vehicle which we'll assume was a tanner brown van given the suspicious sighting of one where Suzanne was found. If you've watched enough crime dramas, you've likely seen a scenario where a single male attacker grabs a woman around the neck from behind, thrusts a knife at her throat, and demands money or perhaps sex. It starts to get a bit more complicated if your goal is to get that person into your car. That's why if your goal is to rob them, I think we can agree that it's a heck of a lot easier to just demand their wallet and run than rob them in your van but hey, maybe you want to drive them to an ATM. Seems to me that now you have to somehow drag them to your van, toss them into it, run to the driver's seat, and hope that by the time you were ready to roll, they hadn't already bolted. I mean, yes, it's possible, but seems to me way too much risk for so little guarantee of a reward. Now, if you had a gun, which the victim knew they could not outrun or could not risk fighting back against, that's a different story. In sum, in this particular instance, I just can't envision a single abductor scenario that is more plausible than a multi-person abductor scenario. Again, I'm not saying a one abductor scenario isn't possible or even plausible, 
just that one abductor is less probable than if there were more than one abductor. I mean, imagine being grabbed by one person while another holds a knife to your throat. One person escorts you to the back of a van and warns you to keep your head down while the other drives. That's why when the van was the centerpiece of the evidence in this murder, this is exactly what I theorized was the most likely scenario. But what could have been the motive? Robbery? Sexual assault? Murder? In actuality, Suzanne was found fully clothed, reportedly dressed exactly as she had been at the Best Buddies pizza making party. She was still wearing her watch and earrings, and according to the TV show 2020, had a crumpled dollar bill in her pocket. Her wallet was later found to be still in her room. Seems to me, if you just wanted someone's wallet, there was no need for an abduction. If the goal was to whisk the victim to an ATM, there was one a block away, also in a very secluded area. No need for an abduction. If the goal were robbery, and you went to these lengths, would you not at least take whatever you could, say a dollar bill, jewelry? That wasn't the case here. If the goal were a sexual assault, seems to me once a young woman gets into a van with two armed attackers, while these attackers may not succeed, they certainly are going to try. There is zero evidence anyone tried. So what are we left with for a motive? Was this perhaps random violence against a Yale student? That was sadly a thing back then. But if murder were always the motive, seems to me leaving the body in a well-lit upscale neighborhood on an unusually warm night when people are out and about would be at the very bottom of my list of choices. This is why the best I could come up with back then for a motive was a robbery gone wrong, that this was an abduct first, ask questions later affair. If so, Imagine the anger that, after all that effort and risk, your victim had no wallet, nothing more than a dollar, nothing you could use to, say, immediately buy drugs with. I theorize that the route they took that night was no accident. East Rock Park was, back then, the place to buy drugs. East Rock Road led to East Rock Park. I speculated that once the abductor holding Suzanne in the back of the van realized she had no money on her, he flew into a rage and began to stab her. The van stopped at East Rock Road heading east, waited for the coast to be clear, rolled through the intersection of Edge Hill, tossed her out, which accounted for why she was found so close to the road, and tossed the fresca bottle into the bushes. So, what's not to like here? Well, let's remember, there is zero evidence Suzanne actually walked as far as the old boarded-up Daily Cafe. There are no known reports of a tan or brown van seen parked in that area, or of an abduction taking place. There is zero evidence of an abduction at all let alone one that involved more than one person. We are assuming extraordinary risk in general for an abduction versus a much easier armed robbery. And finally, we are assuming a murder in a van, where a scream would have been muffled, not heard, as reported in this case by others out and about. The only reason this makes any logical sense is because we are dealing with only two data points, a bottle of Fresca and a van. Well, it turns out we need to factor in more data points, more evidence, and see where that may point us. This evidence, for some reason, didn't emerge until well after the crime. We'll explore this additional evidence in Part 3. Welcome back to my series on the murder of Yale student Suzanne Jobin. Part 1 talked about the crime itself. Part 2 focused on various Suzanne did not know her killer theories. Part 3 will focus on some additional evidence that help us postulate some Suzanne did know her killer theories. At the end of June 2008, nearly a decade after the murder, the Joven Task Force revealed that, only days after the crime, quote, a female motorist told police that she was driving in the area of Whitney Avenue and Huntington Street at about 10 p.m. when she saw a white male in his 20s or 30s with an athletic build, well-groomed hair, dark pants, a loose-fitting greenish jacket running like his life depended on it in the opposite direction from where Suzanne Joven was killed, and then disappear into church property. That's a lot to take in, and there's a bit more I will add to this narrative, but a bit later. As to the witness herself, I was told that she literally begged the New Haven police to take her seriously. The extent they did was to show her a picture of Suzanne's thesis advisor, who, we learned much later, they had nothing more than a mere hunch about. When the police showed her his picture, she said, no, that's not the guy. That answer didn't sit well, so they took her to see him personally. Once again, she said, no, that's not the guy I saw. I think we can safely say that when you label someone a suspect, then leak their name to the press on a hunch, that is, all before you even have a shred of evidence implicating them, you have now obligated yourself to doing everything you can to make this pronouncement a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, fake it until you make it, or in this instance, 
until perhaps a real killer falls into your lap. Sadly, when you think about it, this myopia makes sense. Entire careers stand to be destroyed if this murder is definitively solved. I am confident it can be solved, for all intents and purposes, but I'm hesitant to say I think the powers that be will allow it to be adjudicated definitively, but I digress. Given this context, it should now be obvious why this witness's testimony was buried for a decade. It was only because, a year earlier, the state of Connecticut created a Joven Task Force consisting of four retired esteemed law enforcement professionals to help investigate the case that this was unearthed. Additionally, the task force released this sketch of what we call the running man. Okay, now let's focus on the second piece of evidence, the tip of the knife that was lodged in Suzanne's head. That's most definitely the murder weapon, the crown jewel of evidence. Recall Suzanne was stabbed 17 times in the head and neck area, her throat slit. Yet, after all that, she was found alive. Back on January 27, 2001, an eerily similar murder happened in the vicinity of another Ivy League institution, Dartmouth College. The woman killed was also named Suzanne, also from Germany, and also stabbed repeatedly with a knife. Specifically, Suzanne and Hap Santop, both professors at Dartmouth, were killed in their home by two high school classmates wielding identical military-style knives who went knocking on doors pretending to need help with the school survey. In reality, they were randomly looking for a victim to rob and murder. The police did not find the murder weapon, but instead, both knife sheaths, which they subsequently matched to a specific model and brand of knife. They then obtained a list of internet-related purchases, narrowing in on area residents, leading them to the killers. I have been told by multiple people that despite actually having a piece of the murder weapon, no attempt was ever made to uniquely match this tip to an actual model and brand of knife. Mind-boggling. The only description we have of the knife comes from the TV show 2020, who announced the medical examiner would later determine that their murder weapon was a 4-5 to five inch non-serrated carbon steel knife. We also know that at one point early in the investigation, the FBI did do a metallurgy report on the knife tip. That report has never been released. Given the diversity and uniqueness of the composition of the steel used to make various knife models, as well as knife blade properties such as hardness, angle, and grind, it's mind-boggling to think perhaps Suzanne Joven's murder could have been solved similar to the Zantop murders. Perhaps it can still be. We can only hope. Imagine a 5-inch, non-serrated carbon steel blade plunged into your body. One's heart is about 1 to 1 and a half inches beneath one's chest. Such a knife used with any sort of force could rip somebody apart, creating a bloody mess. We all know people hit in the head bleed profusely. Imagine the mess if this sort of blade were plunged into a skull. The Zantop murders with the military-style knives were a bloody mess. Yet, I have heard repeatedly that the area in which Suzanne was found was not. Yes, of course, there was blood. The ground underneath her was soaked. But remember, we are talking 17 stab wounds here, or a slit throat, yet Suzanne was still found alive. Something here just doesn't compute. Yet. In part two, we discussed the mysterious tan or brown van that was seen across the street from where Suzanne was found. In part one, we talked about the couple who found her, a medical resident and her male friend who were strolling up East Rock Road toward the murder scene looking at Christmas decorations. They heard a single scream, but nothing that made them think that someone was getting murdered. In my talks with a resident, she told me she doesn't recall anyone running down the street past them, nor a Tanner Brown van either driving past them or parked. On December 4, 2015, the 17th anniversary of the crime, the Connecticut Cold Case Unit, under the auspices of the state's attorney, issued a two-page statement that curiously omitted any mention of this van which, recall, was spotted at the corner of East Rock and Enchill Road. Rather, it was focused on the complete opposite corner of East Rock Road and Whitney Avenue, a fifth of a mile away. It was here, 750 Whitney Avenue to be precise, that a witness told investigators about walking past a white man and a white woman arguing as they were leaving the front entrance of the apartment building at around 9.30 p.m. Recall Suzanne was also last seen between 9.25 and 9.30 p.m. walking north on College Street. Hmm. We'll revisit this in a moment. Furthermore, investigators said another witness living in the rear side of 750 Whitney also heard an argument between a woman and another person. It was her impression that these two people knew each other and were having a domestic dispute. Shortly after, she heard screams coming from East Rock Road, though it's unclear exactly where. Investigators theorized that this argument continued all the way up East Rock to the intersection of Edge Hill. 
Let's return for a moment to our timeline. If we assume Suzanne was last seen as early as 9.25 p.m., then we have a mere five minutes or so to get her into a vehicle, then two miles across town, parked, and somehow leaving, not arriving at, the front entrance of 750 Whitney Avenue. Again, five minutes. Google Maps estimates that even at 3 a.m., this trip still takes nine minutes. And even if we could, as in Star Trek, beam Suzanne and another person to this location at 9.30 p.m., then we now have to assume it took these two 20 minutes to walk a fifth of a mile, arguing all the while, before he decides it's time to stab her. Sorry, but even science fiction doesn't lend any credence to these 750 Whitney-related accounts having anything to do with the murder. Meanwhile, back at the original corner of concern, East Rock and Edge Hill, we learn of additional accounts of passers-by hearing people arguing there. One witness, who had turned westbound up East Rock from Whitney, heard an argument as he approached the intersection. According to the 2015 statement, quote, the argument was loud between a man and a woman, and the words are consistent with other witness reports, end quote. This same witness also reported observing a light-colored mid-sized vehicle parked there. Another witness driving on East Rock in the opposite direction eastbound reported seeing a light-colored mid-sized four-door sedan parked at the curb on East Rock Road near Edge Hill Road. Quote, this witness reported that the driver's side front door was open and the headlights and interior lights were on. The witness observed a man and a woman standing on the sidewalk near the light-colored vehicle, end quote. So, is the light-colored mid-sized vehicle the same as a light-colored mid-sized four-door sedan? And are either of these the same as a Tanner Brown van we spent so much time talking about? Given the van is no longer even mentioned, and given the similarity of the two other sightings combined with the same odd location where it is parked, I have to conclude they are all indeed one and the same. Note that the house behind the hedges where the fresca bottle was found fronts Edge Hill, not East Rock Road. Ditto for the house across the street. Visitors to these houses would typically park in front of these houses, on Edge Hill Road. That's what makes a car parked here considered to be unusual. Though I'm not exactly sure how close to the corner the car was, given the telephone pole, the guy wire coming off it, and the tree all posing obstructions to opening the two passenger doors, as well as the fact that witnesses' view of a man and a woman was not obscured by the vehicle, I'm going to assume the car was parked a bit further east from where Suzanne was found. So now we have Suzanne and her eventual killer standing and arguing outside a car with an open driver's side door that apparently was pulled over rather than parked. Given the fresco bottle with Suzanne's prints on it found nearby in the bushes, implying she exited the vehicle holding it, and given neither party has strayed too far from the car, we can assume that there was concern, but apparently not duress, at least insofar as Suzanne bolting from the car and having to be chased down. As for what was being said between the apparently arguing couple, a resident near the corner reported hearing a woman shouting, quote, Why are you doing this to me? How can you do this? End quote. Not exactly what I would expect someone getting repeatedly stabbed to say. I'm thinking more along the lines of, help, please help me, but let's still take it at face value. Given Suzanne had no defensive wounds, the only reasonable explanation I can think of here is that the killer had felled Suzanne onto the ground and pinned her on her stomach while now repeatedly stabbing her, and she's unable to process what is happening to her. At some point, he slits her throat, which, given all this, we'd have to assume came last. Yet, as I keep feeling compelled to mention, Suzanne's killer takes off while Suzanne is still alive. In sum, we now have Suzanne apparently willingly getting into a vehicle, driven by her killer, and carrying a fresca, likely around 9.36 p.m. This likely puts them at the corner of East Rock and Edge Hill Roads at 9.44. She is found stabbed by a passers-by at about 9.53, this leaves only five to eight minutes for this argument to be ended in murder, right out in the open on an unusually warm night in a posh, well-lit area with people out and about, hardly the definition of a planned killing. We'll discuss theories later. For now, let's continue with trying to figure out the likely facts. For example, where does Suzanne's killer go? The most likely explanation is that he got back into the vehicle and drove away. If so, one would assume he took the quickest route out of there, which meant not making a U-turn. Rather, to just keep heading in the direction the car was pointed, east down East Rock Road, toward Whitney Avenue. 
For sure, there was no such vehicle still there a minute or so later when the passers-by found Suzanne near death. Nevertheless, the medical resident who found her told me she did not observe any suspicious vehicle at all go flying by her or her friend. But if the killer drove away in a vehicle, who was this mysterious running man wearing a loose-fitting greenish jacket running like his life depended on it? Do we care? The answer is yes, we care, because all evidence points to the running man as being Suzanne Joven's killer. We'll discuss this running man in detail in Part 4. Over the past 20 years, I've had a steady stream of people writing me with people of interest they think may have been Suzanne Joven's killer. I've also heard of people confessing to the crime. Given that her murder is now on pretty much every top unsolved murders list out there, I've seen no fall off in interest. Most of what people offer falls into the category of please check out so-and-so because I get really bad vibes about him. Here's why I think so-and-so could have been her killer and why he might have done it. On the one hand, they indeed might be right. I wish they were. The problem is that absent any data points that can be validated, these fall into the hunch category. Hunches are a good start on which to build a theory, but I don't have the time nor resources to make that leap. I feel it necessary to point this out because in nearly 20 years of doing this, I've only had two theories offered to me with presented avenues of follow-up to validate or invalidate. Theory number one of two is the tan van. Recall that for the first decade or so, a mysterious tan or brown van was the focus of the investigation, which I talked about in detail in part two. Way back in August of 2001, two and a half years after the murder, I was told that since about April of that year, the New Haven Police Department had impounded such a van, since painted white, but were secreting it from the other impounded vehicles. I was able to then attain a list of titles, the most current being from February 9, 1999 just a few months after the murder. Naturally, I assume this person may have unwittingly purchased a repainted van used in a murder, so tracked him down and talked to him. He shocked me by saying he was indeed the owner at the time of the murder, but that for some reason it took him some time to get around to registering it. He told me he had painted it white prior to the murder, not afterwards, which could have been a lie, but as this was irrelevant insofar as whether this was or was not the killer's car, it was a non-issue to me. What was relevant was that the car still had its original brown shag carpet. My working theory back then was that Suzanne had been randomly abducted by several people, killed in a van, and then discarded from it at the corner of East Rock and Inchill Roads, along with her soda bottle. If true, the carpet would have been soaked in blood and needed to be replaced. It wasn't. Again, I wanted to think the guy I was talking to was a murderer, or perhaps the guy who sold him the van, but the facts didn't add up. Theory 2 of 2 is the running man, a.k.a. Billy. The running man, a.k.a. Billy theory, came to me in June of 2012. The story begins in late October 2011. Two blocks north on Edge Hill Road at the corner of Cliff Street is Egerton Park. Area resident Gilles Carter had just entered the gate to Egerton Park when his guest, a much younger fellow Princeton alumnus, Billy, blurted out, There is something I have to tell you. I am obsessed with the murder of Suzanne Joven. Billy had been a first-year architecture student at Yale in 1998, matriculating just three months prior to Suzanne's murder. Speaking hurriedly and nonstop, intertwined with seemingly random psychosexual illusions, Billy explained that soon after the murder, he had emerged from sleeping in his room to find his roommate watching a broadcast news report about the crime. Quote, they'll never catch me, he told Gilles, he blurted out, explaining that although these words were meant as a joke, ever since then, Billy had spent his life living in fear. The police were constantly surveilling him, trying to trap him into confessing to a crime he did not commit. On the verge of crying, Billy confided to Gilles how totally, utterly unhappy he was and that his obsession with the Joven murder had prevented him from ever having a relationship with a woman. Billy would soon after send Gilles a 30-page meticulously crafted and lucid account called Prisoner 0879431, of life events related to his medically mind-altering internment in the psycho ward at Yale New Haven Hospital over the summer. In it, he recounted his efforts to gain copies of all his medical records from his psychiatrist in Washington, D.C. and Miami to seek out any references he or others might have made to them about, quote, episodes of paranoia regarding being investigated for the to-date unsolved crime, end quote. 
From that and other sources, it appears Billy had become estranged from his family shortly before matriculating at Yale and had been prescribed psychotropic drugs to deal with his emotional pain. At 4.14 p.m., one late winter day that followed, attorney Alan Rosner received a call from Billy asking if Billy could legally transfer title of his condo to his niece by means of a will. Alarmed, Alan asked Billy to explain why, at 38, he was urgently making a will. After a 10-second delay, Billy replied, quote, They're out to get me. They're closing in. Still concerned, Alan got Billy to loudly tell him, quote, I promise I am not going to do anything to hurt myself. A few minutes after hanging up, Billy called back to say, quote, something big was going to happen today, but refused to elaborate as he said he did not want to involve Alan. Billy then did write out a will, had it witnessed by his neighbors, and died after jumping into oncoming traffic on I-95 in New Haven. His official cause of death was graciously listed as an accident. Several weeks later, Gilles, Allen, and two additional Princeton alumni began recounting Billy's untimely and tumultuous demise. They realized that being paranoid about something, like being investigated for murder, was a far cry from being guilty of it. Nevertheless, given that they knew Billy had also been accused by more than one woman of stalking and threatening behavior, they should err on the side of caution and call the Joven Murder Task Force hotline. This task force had been established in the spring of 2007 and consisted of four esteemed former law enforcement officials. A week later, Jules got a call back from lead investigator John Mannion, who thanked him for the information and assured him that Billy would be checked out. A week after that, Alan's home phone rang. The caller ID read that it was Billy calling. Alan could hear Billy's parents in the background reading out loud and then deleting emails off of Billy's computer. Billy's mother later admitted to Gilles that they knew of their son's obsession with Suzanne's murder, but that Billy had assured them he did not kill her. She and her husband then thought it prudent, after wiping Billy's expensive computer hard drive clean, to physically smash and dispose of it. Fearful possible crucial evidence was being destroyed, Gilles called Mannion back to urge him to act swiftly in investigating Billy. Mannion, apparently truly concerned, said he would immediately contact Billy's parents. He also stated his team had located Billy's 1998 roommate and were preparing to head south to interview him. Weeks passed. The four Princeton alums were well aware that information gathering for police investigations normally flowed one way, and thus assured themselves that hearing nothing did not mean nothing was happening behind the scenes, but apparently nothing was. Months passed. The group finally decided to call the hotline and check in. This time the number had been disconnected. Mannion, who had been retired, had been reassigned to active duty in East Haven. The Joven Task Force had been disbanded, and the investigation had now been taken over by the Connecticut State's Attorney's Office. Confused, the group contacted me. When Gilles showed the running man sketch to a former employer of Billy, he remarked, that's him. As sketches are approximations and often resemble a multitude of people, the group turned its attention to the words used to describe the witness's encounter with a person of interest. Quote, a man in his 20s or 30s, with an athletic build, well-groomed hair, dark pants, a loose-fitting greenish jacket running like his life depended on it, in the opposite direction from where Suzanne Joven was killed. Billy was 25 in 1998. His high school yearbook indicated he had been a track star. Billy's friends confirmed that he had kept up long-distance running while in college. Still not allowing themselves to be convinced, the group began a search for photos of Billy circa 1998. What they discovered shocked them and at least four of the pictures taken in diverse locations, in one instance even wearing a tie, there was Billy posing in a loose-fitting greenish jacket. To top it off, as in the sketch, his face was gone. Of course, the Princeton alumni group was well aware that the only aha moment that counted was one from the actual running man eyewitness. Once again, they turned their findings over to law enforcement to elicit such a reaction from this eyewitness. Or not. Shock quickly turned to incredulity. There would be no such encounter with the running man witness because a mere three years after the task force trumpeted her cooperation in a press conference, the New Haven police now deemed her, quote, too old and unreliable. It then became quite clear why it had taken a decade for the running man witness to emerge in the first place. Just days after the crime, she had immediately contacted the New Haven Police Department with her important tip. After a week of trying, she finally got a call back. The New Haven Police Department secretly drove her to see Suzanne's thesis advisor, who, Miliana Hunt, 
been publicly labeled a suspect. They pressed this eyewitness to ID him as the person she saw. She adamantly refused, making it clear he was not the man she had seen that night. The New Haven Police Department tried again and again, each time pushing harder and harder for an ID. The truth was she had not seen Suzanne's 38-year-old thesis advisor out sprinting that night, end of story, and the apparent end of her credibility, as the New Haven Police Department then deep-sixed this vital clue for more than seven years. While law enforcement stonewalled, the Princeton alumni group kept investigating. Next, they focused their attention on the murder weapon. Suzanne had been stabbed 17 times in the back and neck and her throat slit. However, ABC's 2020 news show quoted the medical examiner as saying only one wound was fatal. More bizarre, this knife was apparently so flimsy that the top of its non serrated carbon steel blade had lodged in the left side of her skull. Equally puzzling was that a member of the medical team that had examined her told us that many of the wounds were also consistent with blunt force, as if a screwdriver were used. Billy was an architecture student. Architects use X-Acto knives with a number 11 carbon steel blade. When the tip breaks off, the implement resembles a screwdriver. It would explain why, despite all those blows, only one was deemed fatal. More importantly, such a flimsy weapon would also help explain why Suzanne was found alive, albeit barely. It seemed a pretty simple task to compare the metallurgy test on the murder weapon the FBI had performed on behalf of the New York Police Department with a number 11 X-Acto blade. An autopsy report would presumably go into detail on the nature of the wounds inflicted, such that tests could be done to see if they were consistent with a number 11 X-Acto blade. Once again, the group was stymied. Law enforcement would neither do any new tests themselves, nor allow the group to compare their own test results to what the police had on file. They refused to re-examine her autopsy. Suzanne had been found with no defensive wounds, a fresco bottle with her prints on it nearby, nearly two miles from campus. This implied to the group that Suzanne had willingly gotten into the car of someone she knew, been comfortable enough to grab her soda before walking away from the car, and never saw her attack coming. Similarly, it implied her escort must have simply and irrationally snapped to the point of rage. Might Billy have been considered such a threat? Police records obtained by the group detail an instance where one of Billy's Yale classmates taped a poster on an elevator wall. Quote, Billy, leave him alone before he goes postal. Another report was filed by a woman who had accused Billy of harassing her. People who knew Billy were filled with stories of how he was prone to sudden and frightening emotional outbursts. Making matters worse, Billy had just begun taking prescription psychotropic drugs, which often play havoc with your body until it gets used to them, if ever. So yes, Billy very much did fit the profile of someone disposed to snapping at a moment's notice. Ironically, Billy's rationale for killing himself was obviously wholly unfounded that after nearly 11 years of constant surveillance, the police were finally going to arrest him for the murder of Suzanne Joven. Rather, the moment law enforcement was presented with information suggesting further investigation of Billy was warranted, the task force was disbanded. In follow-up to the state's attorney's office, the rationale for nearly nine months of minimal follow-through was that they talked to a few people, could not establish that Billy knew Suzanne, and therefore it made no sense to waste any more time on a case they had already labeled as unsolvable. And therein lies the rub. If the case remains unsolved, might it be true that nobody can ever accuse Yale, the city of New Haven, and even the state of Connecticut of botching the investigation from day one? Such would be an important perception to present with regard to ongoing or potential future lawsuits filed against them. Granted, most of the people involved in the original investigation are long gone, but for the current group, might there be a not-invented-here mentality for fear of embarrassment that it was a group of amateurs that finally solved the crime? Nevertheless, How Billy might have known Suzanne is for sure a good question, and absolutely one the group had been asking itself all along. But unlike law enforcement, the group actually had established a possible avenue of further investigation, the Yale German Club. Suzanne had co-founded the club to bring together, quote, all German-speaking undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, as well as postdoc staff and friends. Billy spoke quite proficiently in German. Another intriguing aspect of the case has always been Suzanne's last email, when she wrote in German to a friend whose GRE study materials she had borrowed and then lent to, quote, someone else. As Suzanne told her friend she could come pick up these materials later in her, Suzanne's lobby, it seems reasonable to speculate that Suzanne had planned to have had those materials returned to her by that night. As nobody has ever come forward to claim they were the borrower, 
This despite public pleas by the task force in a concerted investigation trying to find said person, it also seems reasonable to speculate said person might have arranged to rendezvous with Suzanne that night, or perhaps had coincidentally run into her, or perhaps was waiting for her in front of her apartment to gain entry to her lobby. Admittedly, Billy already being in graduate school had no need of borrowing GRE materials. But men have done stranger things to get closer to women they desire, and Suzanne was a woman many men reportedly did desire. Perhaps he, having gotten into Yale's Graduate School of Architecture, had offered to tutor Suzanne. Additionally, both Suzanne and Billy were over 21, shared a love of dancing and socializing at local night spots, and Suzanne's apartment was just one street over from where Billy attended all his classes. For sure, such an expected meetup with Billy would not have aroused any suspicions for Suzanne. Perhaps Billy offered her a ride back home, which she either accepted because she was tired from her walk or figured it would be impolite to decline. Once in his car, about to return the only good excuse he had to privately see her, the GRE materials, it was now or never to gain her affection. Could they talk at her place? No? Okay. How about we just drive around and talk? Once it became apparent what Billy actually wanted to talk about, though two miles from campus, Perhaps Suzanne politely asked to be allowed out of his car so she could catch the nearby Yale minibus back to campus. Billy consents. He parks the car. Suzanne calmly gets out, still clutching her soda bottle. Billy sits and stews for a bit. He becomes agitated. He follows after her, and the two start exchanging heated words. When she turns to walk away, to reject him, he snaps. He takes out an exacto knife, or perhaps a similar knife that architects typically use, jumps on her, and starts stabbing at her from behind, before she can comprehend what is happening. At some point, the tip of the blade snaps and gets lodged in her skull, making the remaining blows resemble blunt force trauma. For his final act, he slits her throat, then runs off. But is there any evidence that Billy is prone to snapping with women? Yes, we actually found a police record of Billy becoming violently agitated when he was rejected at a club by a woman. This woman said she feared for her safety. Despite the severity of the attack, the entire episode might have taken less than a minute. Perhaps instinctively, Billy runs away from the murder scene and thus away from where his car was parked. As Suzanne now lay on East Rock Road, perhaps he runs one block south to Huntington Street, where he flies down the hill like his life depended on it towards Whitney Avenue. Meanwhile, the woman who would later inform the police about the running man is making a right turn onto Whitney Avenue, exiting the parking lot of the church across the street. Billy encounters the car and, like a panicked deer, runs parallel to the car for a bit before cutting in front, making a beeline right through the bushes in front of the church, fading out of sight. When he awoke the next morning from his psychotropic haze, the night before likely seemed like a bad dream. Billy may have spent the next 13 plus years of his life on earth trying to prove to himself and by extension others with his constant unsolicited denials that it really was all a dream and thus he surely was not a murderer. But, Before we get too carried away, if Billy was indeed the running man, what about his car? Where is it? There was no vehicle found parked at the crime scene. Where did it go? For sure Billy hadn't driven it away. Add to that, Billy drove a blue Toyota Camry. More perplexing, the running man witness told a local reporter that she had only seen the man in the green jacket for a split second and mostly recalled his square jaw. She also said she had seen or presumably had been shown many pictures of Billy, presumably only in the last few years, but that she was unable to ID him as the running man. Unfortunately, we don't know for sure if she was specifically shown the green jacket pictures of Gaunt Billy circa 1998, not to mention her opinion of whether his jacket itself looked familiar. The reporter also strongly refuted the notion that anyone could conclude she was not a reliable witness. Oddly, we've had numerous official reports of the vehicle, from a tan or brown van to a light-colored four-door sedan, but nothing official on what the so-called arguing couple looked like or were wearing. Per a recent op-ed to the New Haven Register, Yale professor David Cameron did say a witness was able to place, on East Rock Road, both a woman who looked like Suzanne with a man whose features resembled those of the running man. It's, of course, possible that the killer parked his car near the crime scene, but not at it. He then simply returned the next day to retrieve it. Therefore, we can't dismiss the possibility we may be talking about two different couples, albeit at the same location. Okay, I'm going to assume that if you made it this far into the video, that you now have a pretty good handle on this case and want it solved. You are frustrated how the police botched the investigation from day one and threw an innocent person to the wolves, allowing a killer to go free. 
You are equally frustrated how the state's attorney's office still treats this case as an active investigation after 20 years, as an excuse to shield people like us who truly want it solved from the real facts that could help solve it. You are thinking Suzanne is dead, Billy is dead, and that either all the evidence is compromised or we'll never have access to it. We're screwed. Well, what if I told you there may have been two witnesses to the murder itself, two people who I have every reason to believe are still with us? I'll discuss all this in Part 5. In Part 4, we discuss Billy, someone so obsessed with being arrested for the killing of Suzanne Joven that he gathered up all his medical records from around the country, drew up a will, and jumped into traffic on I-95 in New Haven to commit suicide. Billy had been a Yale School of Architecture student in 1998 and spoke fluent German. He was an avid runner who resembled the person depicted in the Running Man sketch, and there are numerous pictures of him wearing a loose-fitting green jacket. The problem is, he did not drive a tan or brown vehicle, be it a van or sedan, but rather a blue Toyota Camry. And even if he had borrowed such a car that night, if he were indeed the running man, we now can't account for his car in which Suzanne would have had to have been his passenger. Meet the good doctor. Let's call him Dr. X. Dr. X is an internist, not a psychiatrist. Dr. X first contacted me on September 17th, 2016. Subject. Joven case witness. Hello, I believe I have information that may be a benefit. I have tried to contact the cold case unit with no response. Last December, I came across an individual who was a direct witness to Miss Joven, the murder in a third party, not previously mentioned. Please feel free to call or email me back and I can let you know what I was told. I take everyone seriously. I called Dr. X. We talked. I took notes. I transcribed my notes into a narrative and then emailed him this narrative asking if what I had written was accurate. He said it was, for the most part, and then clarified what he thought needed to be clarified. His story was as follows. A patient with no known medical history asked Dr. X to treat him for having a history of seizures. Around December of each year, he would have blackouts, the first of which occurring after he had witnessed a horrific and traumatizing murder while he was living and working in New Haven. This medical appointment took place in the November-December 2015 time frame, which was slightly less than a year prior to the date of our conversation. On what was apparently Friday evening, December 4, 1998, the patient was walking back from work in the area. Ironically enough, he was taking a different route than usual because he thought it would be safer. He comes across three individuals on a street corner. Two of these people were arguing, a man and a woman, while the third, a man, was sitting down on a wall. The woman had an accent, which the patient recollected sounded Spanish, and she sounded either high or drunk. The guy she was arguing with wore a dark-colored windbreaker. The guy sitting on the wall had bright red hair and was wearing a Wilbur Cross High School letterman's jacket. Wilbur Cross is a high school in New Haven. The woman, as if trying to either enlist help or disrupt the argument, grabs the patient's wrist and asks for a sip of his water from the soda bottle he is carrying. Note, which Dr. X called Sprite, not Fresca, though both have green bottles. Taken a bit off guard by the request, he instinctively says, sure, at which point the woman scratches his arm in the process of grabbing the bottle, takes a sip, and offers it back. The patient says, that's okay, you can have it. The woman then tosses the bottle overhead like a basketball, whereupon it then bounces off the ground and into the bushes, at which point she jokes, two points Jordan. The guy who had been arguing with the woman now gets agitated and accuses the patient of trying to take away his girl. The patient says, I don't want your girl, I'm gay. No, Dr. X said he actually was gay. The patient then sees the arguing guy pull out what he describes as a camping knife with a 3-4 to four inch blade. He gets about 100 feet away and hears a horrific scream and sees the woman getting repeatedly stabbed. The patient also said he saw a tanner brown van at the scene with tassels saying, Yale class of something or other, hanging from the rearview mirror. The patient did indeed contact the New Haven police in an effort to tell them this information right after the crime. He did not get a call back. My presumption here is that because the police swiftly named the suspect, the patient and many others felt no need to now interject themselves. They were happy to make an active contribution, but now felt no need to be proactive. Yes, this is indeed a whole lot of new information to take in. It for sure answers a lot of unanswered questions, but also poses a bunch more. The first question on my list, and presumably yours, is, is Dr. X's story legit? 
I spent a heck of a lot of time just on that question alone. Yes, I did ask Dr. X for the name of his patient so I could speak to him directly. Dr. X said that he did not recall the patient's name. I asked if he could retrieve the patient's file to refresh his memory. The doctor said he had recently switched hospital affiliations and therefore no longer had access to that patient's file, but that he would try. I then checked Dr. X's affiliation and did indeed confirm this was true. As he was just about to get married, he said he'd get back to me afterwards. He never did. For sure I did try. I hope he does get back to me at some point. Even better, I hope his patient is watching this and contacts me. We'll see. Also for sure, this is not new information to the cold case unit investigating the Joven murder. If they've done their own investigation here on Dr. X and his patient, nobody has informed me as such. But getting back to the credibility of Dr. X. Once again, we are back to a tan brown van rather than a sedan. The new twist here is the Yale class of tassels, implying it was owned by a Yale student, likely undergrad given the words class of. I can visualize what this might have looked like, but I couldn't find any examples to show. A typical tassel is a bunch of strings with perhaps a tiny year added to it. But hey, that's what I was told it was. Yes, not exactly a promising start. The soda bottle, a fresco to be exact, was indeed found in the bushes. However, there is no wall at this location to sit on. However, there is a wall on the other side of Edge Hill, which for sure is low enough to sit on. Was this third person sitting across the street? Was this red-haired person sitting on the ground, but perhaps the patient is confusing the two corners in his mind? As the patient was returning from work, one asked to assume he was coming up East Rock Road from Whitney, which again implies the vehicle was on the Whitney side of Edge Hill. In pictures of Billy online, there is one where he is posing in his dorm room with a fellow Princeton student wearing a letter jacket with the letter C on it. Note that the patient never told Dr. Rex that the letter jacket had any letter on it, only that it was from Wilbur Cross, the local high school. Cross, as they are known for short, traditionally puts a C for Cross, not a W for Wilbur on its logo wear. This roommate was not from New Haven. In fact, in 1998, he, like Billy, was a college graduate. Typically, one stops wearing one's high school letter jacket when one gets to college, but as this roommate clearly was wearing his at Princeton, I suppose it lends some credibility to him, or any college student for that matter, also continuing to wear it afterwards. All of this is important, at least to me, because the entire reason the police do not release everything they know is because it helps them differentiate between people who are actual witnesses. That is, they can tell if someone knows things only a witness would know, versus people who, while well-meaning, weave what they read into a fictional narrative they insist had to have happened, as opposed to did indeed happen. For better or worse, many people do truly believe that what they see in their dreams is real, or that they've truly just experienced a psychic vision they now feel compelled to pass on. Dr. X did not strike me as someone who invented a patient whole cloth just to make his murder theory appear more credible, but who knows. If taken at face value as true, it means Suzanne never bought a fresca, hence we can't now assume she had to have bought it at Krauser's Market. As she apparently got into this vehicle willingly, it makes it much more likely she had a prearranged rendezvous, with the most likely spot being somewhere near Phelps Gate. The overwhelmingly most likely reason for such a rendezvous would have been for Suzanne to have retrieved the GRE materials. As you typically don't offer people alcohol to drink while you are driving, perhaps they asked if she wanted to get high. They drive around, get high, and decide to get some fresh air at the corner of East Rock and Enchill Roads. Billy snaps, kills her, and runs off by heading one block over to Huntington as opposed to down East Rock. The red-haired kid, whose car this likely was, drives off. We can debate all day and all night about whether the doctor is or is not making up a scenario to fit what he has read online, that he invented his patient to make his theory sound more credible. My take on this is why speculate when there are plenty of ways to verify or cast doubt on all of this. It's important to point out here that HIPAA laws specifically carve out exemptions for physicians in, quote, identifying or locating a suspect, fugitive, material witness, or missing person, end quote, as well as, quote, to identify or apprehend an individual who has admitted participation in a violent crime, end quote. There really is no excuse not to locate and advise the patient that the murder he witnessed is unsolved. 
and if the doctor would rather not file an official report with law enforcement, I am personally happy to speak with the witness and be the one to urge him to do so instead. To be clear, I and the Princeton alumni group never started with the premise that Billy had to have murdered Suzanne Joven. If that were the case, Jules would have gone to the police back in October of 2011 when Billy had confessed his obsession of her murder to him. Rather, we decided to instead focus on the available evidence and where that led us. But rather than force us to concoct new scenarios for how Billy might have been a killer, his presence actually helped explain gotchas in prior scenarios. For example, it was inconceivable to me a Yale student was capable of going from calm to rage so quickly so as to inspire actual terror in the person to the point they saw fit to file a police report. Billy had a documented history of doing just that. It made no sense to me how Suzanne could be found alive after 17 stab wounds and a slit throat, nor how or why some of the wounds were described as screwdriver-like blunt force. The use of a flimsy X-Acto knife where the tip had broken off explains this. It was baffling how the couple walking up East Rock Road, who found Suzanne bleeding and dialed 911, never saw the murderer flee right past them, adding to it why the running man had come down Huntington instead of East Rock. Billy, running on foot away from the crime scene and towards his apartment, accounts for this. Not to mention the unusually warm weather made it probable he was wearing his favorite loose-fitting greenish jacket, which the witness clearly described. Given Billy spoke fluent German like Suzanne, it's not at all far-fetched that they could have met at a German club event. And finally, it was always a mystery to me why the person Suzanne had intended to retrieve the GRE materials from that night has never come forward. If Billy were indeed this person, it could explain why Suzanne willingly got into his or his friend's car and why, being her killer, there was no incentive for him to ever come forward. Our group's fact sheet detailing our investigation of Billy is 16 pages long. Most of the group considered Billy a friend and had bent over backwards to help him in his time of need, truly hoping to prove to themselves that Billy really was merely delusional and not a killer. To our knowledge, not a single of our suggestions to the Joven Task Force has been acted upon. Allen even petitioned the Freedom of Information Commission once again for access to the case file to verify this. But, just as I had been back in 2001, Allen was stymied by the state's attorney's office and the prospect of years spent litigating appeals in Superior Court should he get a favorable ruling and face a legal appeal. It has now been seven years since Billy confessed to Gilles. Suzanne Joven had her life taken away 20 years ago, yet not one single lead has ever led to a serious person of interest, let alone a suspect. With one innocent person's reputation already ruined, the group surely did not want to be accused of doing that to someone else. That is why, despite the saying that you cannot defame the dead, the group insisted an alias still be used to conceal Billy's identity from the masses. Billy may indeed turn out to be wholly innocent, but to our knowledge, he was never adequately investigated by law enforcement. Even his Yale classmates have been writing comments online that Billy should no doubt be a strong person of interest. Enough is enough. And lastly, it should come as no surprise that forensic technology here in 2018 is exponentially better than it was in 1998. Every piece of evidence associated with this brutal murder of Yale student Suzanne Joven needs to be re-examined using modern technology. Not using state-of-the-art forensic methods in an effort to solve a 20-year-old homicide is unforgivable, and why I chose to launch this campaign to fund such testing, as well as whatever else it may take for justice to prevail. All of this research and testing, unfortunately, is not cheap. My GoFundMe page is how you, the general public, can help me make this happen. If we are sending this evidence to a private forensics lab, if we are not spending the state of Connecticut's money to do this, if we are not tying up any of the state's resources for all of this, there's absolutely no excuse for the state of Connecticut not to accept our generous offer to fund this endeavor. I hope you found this five-part series eye-opening. If you, like I do, want justice for Suzanne Joven to catch a vicious murder once and for all, please contribute what you can to help. Thank you.